As we continue our Advent series, Sing the Song of Christmas, I invite you to open your Bible this morning to Luke chapter 1, verses 67 through 80. Luke 1, 67 through 80. Last week we listened to Mary's song. This week, uh, Zechariah steps to the mic. Zechariah is a geriatric priest, long in the tooth if he has many teeth left at all, an old man. He's married to a woman named Elizabeth, also a senior adult. She's not a priest, but she has priestly roots, hailing from the family of Aaron, Moses' brother, and the first priest in Israel. But that's not the most striking detail about her in Luke's telling of the story. This is the detail that causes the reader to raise his eyebrows. Elizabeth is barren. She's an old woman who never had a child. No matter how many times she and Zechariah tried in their younger years, no matter what they tried, the rabbit never died. And now, in her last years, menopause long behind, she would surely go to her grave with a desert womb and with arms that never held a child of her own. In that day, women always bore the blame, the pity, and sometimes the scorn for childlessness. It wasn't just considered a sadness, it was considered a curse. That's why it was shocking when an angel named Gabriel visited the priest Zechariah as he was lighting incense in the temple and told him that he was going to be a daddy. Miracle enough that Zechariah drew incense duty. Many priests serve their whole lives and never draw that duty. Another miracle enough that Zechariah was visited by an angel, but the greater miracle is the angel's message to Zechariah, better fix up a nursery, you're gonna have a child. And not just any child, but the Isaiah Malachi prophesied child who would be the forerunner of Messiah. You are to name him John, said Gabriel. He will get people prepared for Messiah. Well, instead of doing somersaults and cartwheels, which at his age probably would have been a challenge to do, Zechariah expressed his doubts. Do you know how old I am? He asked the angel. And my wife, she's no spring chicken either. I get that, don't you? Don't you get that? How many of you have ever received this phone call from your grandmother? Guess what, honey, I'm pregnant. Doesn't happen, doesn't happen. Old people don't have babies. Maybe Gabriel didn't get that. Look, he said, I stand in the presence of God. I got this good news straight from him, so here's the deal. Since you don't believe my message, you won't be able to speak one word until what I have prophesied comes to pass. Meanwhile, people who had gathered outside of the temple to pray, they checked the sundial, and they said, what's taking Zechariah so long? Is he going for a record or something? Well, when Zechariah came out mute as a fish, they figured he'd seen a vision. He tried making signs with his hands, but they couldn't make heads nor tails of any of it. And soon his temple duty was over, and he went home to Elizabeth. He couldn't say a word to her, but somehow he got the message across, to which Elizabeth replied, you want to do what? Anyway, this postmenopausal prune-wombed woman conceived a child. And you'd think she'd have been spreading the news all over Judea, but she kept it to herself, Luke says. Became a hermit for five months. Did she fear she might lose that child to miscarriage? Did she think this was all just too good to be true? But we do know this, was she ever grateful? She knew it was about more than simple biology. She said, the Lord has done this for me. He's looked with favor on me and taken away my disgrace. Well, Luke suddenly shifts scenes to tell the story of Gabriel's visit to Mary. He was just full of good news, this angel. Mary, you found favor with God. You're gonna bear the Messiah. And Jesus is even more a miracle baby than John because Mary is a virgin. But the Holy Spirit mysteriously conceives Jesus in Mary's womb. Mary then goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth and Elizabeth's baby John leapt in the womb at the sound of Mary's voice and Luke then returns to John's story in verse 57. John is born. They hang blue balloons on the doorpost and neighbors are jumping up and down with joy and Zechariah's passing out cigars and this is a miracle that geriatrics like Zechariah and Elizabeth it's a miracle because they are more suited for the nursing home than the maternity ward. But here they are with a baby in their arms. And when John was eight days old, that's 
circumcision day, that's naming day. The folks assumed they'd name him after his daddy. No, Elizabeth said, we're going to call him John. Well, they turned to mute Zechariah for his opinion. He took a tablet and he wrote what she said. His name is John. And Zechariah's tongue was immediately loosed and he burst into song. And I invite you to hear that song in the word of the Lord. Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Blessed is the Lord, the God of Israel, because he's visited and provided redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets in ancient times. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us. He's dealt mercifully with our fathers and remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. He's given us the privilege since we've been rescued from the hand of our enemies to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness in his presence all our days. And you, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of our God's merciful compassion, the dawn from on high will visit us to shine on those who live in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. The child grew up and became spiritually strong, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So the priest becomes a prophet, and he sings the Benedictus. That's what this song is called because the first word in the Latin text is benedictus, English, blessed. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel because he has visited and provided redemption for his people. This is not the song that you might expect. After nine mute months of not being able to tell his story of the prophesied child that he fathered, and then after eight days of holding the child in his arms without being able to say, look at my boy, or is he the cutest thing you've ever seen, or no, I'm not his great-grandfather, I'm his daddy, old man Zechariah, can speak again. And you'd expect he'd be full of news about his boy. He's not. He's full of praise to our promise-making, promise-keeping God and for the boy in Mary's womb. Through Holy Spirit inspiration, Zechariah grasped that though his son John is a big story, John is not the biggest story. The biggest story is this, Messiah is on the way. And he comes as fulfillment of all the promises God made to David and to Abraham. And he comes to save us from our enemies. Now, Zechariah calls the Messiah a horn of salvation. The word horn doesn't mean trumpet or tuba or trombone. It refers to the horn of an animal. It is a symbol of great strength. Think elephant's tusk. Think rhino's horn, the paw of a bear, the fang of a lion. Strong, majestic, victorious. Messiah is our horn of salvation. No enemy can defeat him. No opponent can prevail. Messiah comes to defend and save and rescue his people. Zechariah might have been thinking in his own mind about deliverance from the tyranny of Rome, but we know that Messiah delivers us from far more lethal enemies than that. In his great mercy, in his amazing grace, Messiah delivers us from the power of sin and death. And he accomplished our salvation not by taking up a sword and slaughtering Rome, but by taking up a cross and dying for our sins, bearing in his own body their penalty and their power. It looked like his enemies win the day. And when Joseph rolled that heavy stone across the tomb to seal it tight, the tomb in which he had just buried Jesus, it looked like Jesus' enemies got the last word, but they didn't. Messiah gets the last word. On the third day after the cross, Jesus rose up from the dead bearing the scars of the cross, but very much alive, very much well, and very much king. 
So, sings Zechariah, no longer do God's people have to cower in the face of our enemies. We can serve the Lord, he says, without fear. We can serve him in holiness and righteousness. Messiah gives us that through the cross and through the resurrection. And even more, we can enjoy Messiah's presence all of our days in this world and forever in the next. Like Mary does in her song, Zechariah speaks of future things in the prophetic past tense. Someone said it this way, Zechariah inhabits that weird prophetic space where time expands and contracts until it's hard to tell what has been from what will be. Zechariah's song of Christmas is a song of praise to the God who has sent Messiah to save us. Now it's not first about Zechariah's own son John, it's first about God's son Messiah. During John's ministry, John said this of Jesus, he must Remember, he must increase, but I must decrease. I wonder if John learned that humble spirit from his father, Zechariah, whose song of Christmas is way more about God's son than his own son. But Zechariah does sing a brief verse about his son John in this song. Look, look with me. Listen to verses 76 and 77. And you, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Isaiah prophesied that John would come before Messiah. Messiah. Isaiah said, a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And in God's last word to his people before 400 long years of silence, the prophet Malachi foretold John's appearance to look I'm going to send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Malachi called Zechariah's son Elijah. God told Zechariah to call him John, but John would come as a prophet in the spirit of Elijah. So Zechariah identifies his son as the prophesied forerunner to Messiah, a prophet the preparer of Messiah's ways, a preacher of salvation through the forgiveness of sins. That's John, that's what he did. In verse 80, Luke writes of John, the child grew up and became spiritually strong and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance. That day came about 30 years later when John, this bug-eating preacher who dressed like a hick, came out of the wilderness preaching up a storm an Ernest T. Bass come out of the hills to throw rocks at the establishment. <laughs> Luke writes in chapter three that John went into all the vicinity of Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This was John's message, turn from your sins and get washed up because Messiah is on the way. Just as you'd clean up your house to prepare for an important guest, clean up your life to prepare for Messiah. John was a fiery preacher. He was a big deal. Luke says crowds came to be, crowds came to be baptized by him. He was such a big deal that some thought he was the Messiah. Don't put that Messiah name tag on me, John said. I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie his shoe. Besides, I, I baptize you with water, but when Messiah comes, he's gonna baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John was really something. You might not believe him, but you sure couldn't ignore him. He was that kind of preacher, very personal and all up in your grill. And he ended up in jail because he had the nerve to rebuke the King Herod and list all of his sins for people to hear. John preached a lot about sin. There was a real note of judgment in his preaching. John didn't come to hold hands. John came to clean hearts. Luke 3 provides samples of his preaching. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. The ax is already at the root of the tree and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And that includes you, King Herod. For marrying your brother's wife while she was still married to him, you adulterer. John's preaching heralded a new day, a day of preparation for the new thing that God was fixing to do through Messiah Jesus. After God had kept his lips zipped for 400 years, 
John was his voice calling, booming out of the wilderness, repentance, forgiveness, and new life that Messiah would bring. His job was to get people ready for the Savior. John's preaching and baptizing served as a signal. It was a signal for Jesus to go public with his ministry. So one day, Jesus showed up at the Jordan to be baptized by John. John didn't think he was worthy to baptize Jesus, Jesus ins- but, but Jesus insisted that he do it. So John baptized the one that John called the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now when Zechariah sang this song, he didn't know all that it would, how all this would unfold, but he did know this. The Lord's visit to the earth began with the birth of his son John. John was firing the starter's gun to get Messiah's ministry rolling. John was sent to prepare the way for Messiah. So Zechariah's song is more about Jesus than it is about John, but he does give John this brief shout out in his song of Christmas. Any daddy's gonna smuggle that in. But then he quickly turns his lyrics back to Messiah, listen again. Look with me at verses 78 and 79. Because of our God's merciful compassion, the dawn on high will visit us to shine on those who live in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. We live in a dark, broken, anxious world, desperate for a savior. 26-year-old woman in Beijing leaned a little too hard against a roadside barrier, got her neck stuck between two of the railings. Chinese bystanders did, did what, what they're increasingly notorious for doing, nothing. Security camera footage showed over a dozen people gathered around her, gawking and taking photos of the woman who stood helpless beside the side of a busy Beijing street in broad daylight for 30 minutes before anyone tried to help. Finally, someone called the police who came, pulled her out, rushed her to the hospital. She was pronounced brain dead a few hours later. Well, hey, let's not throw rocks at China. This happens in our country all the time because that's the kind of world we live in. Zechariah sings a song of a God who when he looks down on our darkness and our suffering, he doesn't do so with cool indifference, cool distance with this with, it, with, with this I don't want to get involved attitude. And it sounds like Zechariah was thinking of Isaiah's prophecy here. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And the light has dawned on those who are living in the land of darkness. And, and Malachi's prophecy too, for, for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings and you will go out and playfully jump like calves from the stall. Messiah is light in our darkness. He's the one who comes to redeem us from the prison of sin in which we have placed ourselves. He is life in our death. He is peace in our anxiety in this broken, troubled world, and his coming can turn our dirge into a dance, moved with mercy and compassion for our darkness and our lostness. God comes at just the right time to bring remedy through Messiah Jesus, and if that doesn't provoke a song, I don't know what would. Zechariah sings quite a song. It's a song of praise. It's a song of celebration. Most of all, it's a song of salvation for all who put their trust in Messiah Messiah Jesus. Zechariah's song foreshadows John's preaching. God's salvation is on the way through Messiah. Zechariah was serious about salvation. So was John. And as we prepare for the coming of Christ, we need to be serious about our salvation too, about real salvation, real salvation, not this cheap imitation that's so common in the church these days. Do you know what I mean by the cheap imitation of salvation? I mean the cheap imitation that equates church membership, occasional church attendance, and a little Bible knowledge, and being a generally good person that equates that to salvation. I I mean the cheap imitation in which a person wants Christ only so far as Christ doesn't interfere with her life. I mean the cheap imitation that wants the benefits of Christ without the cross of Christ. The cheap imitation that wants about 
five bucks worth of a billion dollar God. This, the, the, these cheap imitations, they're not salvation. All they amount to is a little religion and a lot of false assurance. Real salvation involves life change. That was John's message. Produce good fruit in keeping with repentance. And when the people asked what he meant by that, he got specific. Man with two shirts, share one of those shirts with the one who has none. The one who has food on his table, share food with the person who has no food. He told tax collectors, he said, quit cheating people and collect only what's required. And he told soldiers, instead of abusing their power to extort money, they should just be content with what they're paid. The message is clear. When we repent of our sin and come to salvation, we experience life change. We're saved by grace alone. John's name means grace by God. We're saved by grace alone. Saving grace, though, always gives way to life change, which is the evidence of real salvation. That's what John came to get us ready for. Jesus came to save people from head to toe. He came to make generous people out of misers, honest people out of cheaters, servants out of power mongers, forgivers out of grudge bearers, pure people out of dirty minded ones, free people out of addicts and humble people out of arrogant snobs. Jesus came to save people from head to toe and everything in between. And since it cost Jesus so much suffering and pain on the cross to do it, don't think he's going to settle. Don't think he's going to settle for some cheap imitation of real salvation he came to bring. And John tried to get us ready for that. Here's a good question to consider as we prepare for Christmas. Has salvation produced any real life change in you? Could people that you know in your family at work, school, deer camp, social club, fishing hole, golf course, could they say without a doubt, yes, she's a Christian? Yes. No doubt, she's a Christian. I see it in the way she loves God and the way she loves others and the way she treats her enemies and I see it in the way she loves his church and she's often talking to us about coming to know Jesus too. Do you know the salvation of which Zechariah sings and John would later preach? Do you know this real salvation? If you don't know the salvation of the Lord, today is the day to experience that salvation. Today is the day to repent of your sins and give Jesus your life. Today is the day by grace to receive God's forgiveness for your sins and then follow Jesus into the life that's really life. Today's the day. Not tomorrow, not next week, not after Christmas, not in 2022. Today is the day. Zechariah's Christmas song calls us to get serious about our own salvation, to make sure we're ready for Jesus when he comes. Prepare the way of the Lord, preached John, because he's making his way to you. Jesus is coming, so get serious about your sin and repent and get serious about your salvation and receive that wonderful gift of God, that God gives us when we put our trust in the crucified, resurrected Messiah, Jesus. Zechariah sings a song of Christmas and it's a song of salvation for all who believe. Don't just listen to Zechariah's song this morning. Live it. Get ready for Messiah. My friend Bob Johnston shared about a conversation he had over coffee with a fellow pastor who had just been fired from his church. What happened, Bob asked. It was my sermon. They didn't like my sermon. Oh, what in the world did you say? Well, I just got tired of all the hypocrisy and all the apathy in it. And so I decided I was just going to tell it like it is. I got up in the pulpit and I began to name their sins. So you, you gave them a list of sins they were guilty of. You all have been lax in your devotion. You've, you're careless in your dedication, things like that. <laughs> oh no, I was more specific. I named names. <laughs> I said, Sister Susie, you're the biggest gossip I ever heard and I wish God would just cut out your tongue. And Brother John, what a hypocrite you are. You pray your pious prayers in church and run around on your wife. 
And Deacon Sam, you walk around with this big dagger ready to stab it in everybody you can. Well, my friend Bob looked at this guy like this. You didn't really say all that, did you? Sure I did. And they fired me, the bunch of babies. His congregation felt what John's congregation felt when John preached. And if I preached that way to you today, if I looked around and called out names, pointed out particular sins, would you want to fire me? Or would you confess and repent of your sins and seek the forgiveness and grace of Jesus? It is Advent. Jesus is coming. Get serious about your sin and about his salvation. That's what John came to get us ready to do, and I plead with you. I plead with you to do this today. Today. Whether you're online or in the room, if you do not know Christ, Today, confess your sins and your need of him and invite him to be your savior. Give your life to him. He will save you today. If you're here and you're you're wrestling with some sins to the point of where you don't even confess them, you just kind of surrendered to them, today I invite you to slam on the brakes and to cry out to God for mercy Cry out in repentance and seek forgiveness and strength to live the salvation that you claim and that you have in Jesus. And if you're just kind of lingering out here without a church, just thinking I'll just pop into this church one week and a few weeks later I'll go to that one. Hey, it's all cool, I love Jesus. You need to get connected to a church. This one or someone, I invite you to do that today. I invite you to pray and seek God's face in this season of Advent to get very serious about your sin and your need and about the salvation, the rich salvation that Jesus gives. and Make this a season of repentance, confession, and the life-changing salvation Jesus brings. God, meet us in these moments. Do your work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.